All right, everybody, now that we have watched industrialization and we saw Britain blow it up, let's, uh, let's talk about how it spreads and the impacts there. And once again, we're looking at the early moves in Britain, and then it's going to move throughout Europe, like to France, Germany, Belgium, and then eventually into the United States. And, and the question is, why for these countries? I mean, German was a little, Germany was a little bit late due to its political instability, as I have in the notes here. But once they get unified and they're able to attack their resources, because they have a lot of coal too, they're really going to follow that British mold and in many ways be challengers to Britain. The United States, for instance, though, I mean, they've got a massive country. You don't have to import as much stuff. Um, the United States government would be very pro-business, which will be huge, which we'll get into in the impacts of industrialization. Lots of land, lots of resources again. And, and when you put that stuff together, lots of resources and a pro-business government, you're going to succeed. Now, there were some other countries where you got some, some guys getting involved, and Russia is exactly that. I mean, early on, they had an issue with their small labor force, and because serfs weren't allowed to leave the land, you definitely had a labor issue. Um, and they always had to go back to harvest because they really didn't have a manufacturing arm. But by the 1890s, they start to embrace industrialism a little bit, not as much as everybody else as we'll get into. And as a result, the population is, start, is going to increase in and around the cities by the 1890s. And one of the big things they realize is that they have this giant country, but they need to be able to access the resources in it. And that's where the Trans-Siberian Railroad comes into play. This is the largest railroad in the world, 5,787 miles. It goes from Moscow over here to Vladivostok all the way down there, um, as well as with some little offshoots here. Um, and this gives you an idea how big Russia is from one end here. You have a zero time zone and here is nine hours ahead. So that's a lot of land. Um, the Trans-Siberian Railroad was huge. It's going to help mining operations. It's going to help with the push to industrialize. But the problem that Russia is going to have is that the peasants are still dealing with the bulk of the taxes. The wages are terrible. The government is inept, which we talked about, and they never really draw grow a huge economy because they don't have the money, they can't put it into industrialization. And that's why they're going to have an issue. Japan, on the other hand, is going to go full bore industrialization. As you saw in the previous video, after the United States quote unquote opened them up or basically threatened to destroy them, they realized they had to change. So what the government's going to do is bring in outsiders to set up factories and train their workers and basically fix their business. And they're going to be open pretty much to trade everything. And because they do that, they are looked at differently than, say, China or the other areas of Southeast Asia that were colonized. Um, they're really going to modern their iron facilities. They're going to get better ports and dockyards. They're going to develop their banking. And then eventually, they're going to develop these huge businesses called Zaibatsus. And they're kind of similar to trusts and cartels. In other words, these are businesses that own a lot of smaller businesses. Um, the most famous in the United States was like, Carnegie, how he owned the steel plants, and then he owned the railroads, and then he owned the mines. Uh, Mitsui was your biggest one that knew, uh, that had interest in banking, trade, mining, food production, and textile manufacturing. And when you have all this business, Japan is still a powerhouse today, and it's because of this time period. Now there are other areas where it's not as good. South America, Africa, and the Middle East. The fact of the matter is these three Two of these three areas were still the colonies. South America, whereas they were free by the later 1800s, um, the Europeans or the Americans really weren't setting up businesses there. And really, all they could provide were the raw goods, you know, foods, ores, things along that line. And the fact of the matter is, is remember, as we've talked about this before, the raw goods bring less of a return than manufactured goods. So you have to keep wages low, which are going to keep people in really sustenance living. And that's going to be a major issue in particularly South America today. Um, free trade at that point was the norm. So foreign goods were often less expensive than local goods. And the impact really wasn't 
really that good. Um, one, even though you have this nice farm over here, they're not making a lot of money. And two, over here on the right, they have to clear cut the land in order to keep up with the demand. And so in many of these areas, you see environmental degradation, but no development of strong industry or business, which really plagues these areas today. But when you put all this stuff together, which eventually you have the development was capitalism. Capitalism was developed by that man, Adam Smith from Scotland. Brilliant dude, went to college when he was like 13, 14 years old. So, you know, he was kind of awesome. But he wrote his most famous work, Wealth of Nations, which the desire of that was to develop an economic system for use of maximum gain. And I have a quote here that really sums it up. It says, give me that which I want and you shall have that which you want. It is in this manner that we obtain from one another the far greater part of those goods which we stand in need of. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their own regard to their self-interest. The idea behind this quote, guys, is that basically everybody is in it for themselves, and the butcher and the baker are going to make good food for us to eat, so we will buy it for them so that they can have a living. Yes, they may like me and might not mind feeding me, but the fact of the matter is, is they need money to feed themselves. So the idea and the basic concept between capitalism is that there are uncounted economic transactions every single day. And all of those transactions are done in self-interest. I am doing what is in best interest for myself. So because I want what's best for me, I'm going to seek out the best quality stuff for the lowest prices. Now, because of that, producers, the people that make the goods, have to then make goods that are worthwhile and maintain prices that I will actually be willing to buy things at because they need to make money. Because of that, then it results in good competition because if you make something expensive but it's not made that good and I can make it cheaper and charge less and make it better than you, I'm going to make more money. You lose money, therefore you need to respond and make something better and maybe drop the price. Boom, everybody wins. And then the final person that wins is the government because I, as a consumer, win because people are making the products that I want to buy. The producers win because I'm buying stuff for them. And then the government wins because they can charge taxes on everybody. The role of the government in this is that they need to be very hands-off, okay? That the only role the government is really going to have is to make sure you don't have monopolies. Because when you have one company that runs everything, everybody else loses. And in the end, what we end up having, once again, is people are guided by self-interest in order to succeed. And Adam Smith calls this the concept of an invisible hand, that an invisible hand is going to drive people to do what's right for them, and in essence, that is right for the greater economy as a whole. Now, the problem is, is that if you don't regulate the economy at all, you've got like child labor and ridiculously low wages and horrible work conditions, and that's not good. So there really isn't anybody that has pure capitalism today because that isn't effective. But what it is, is capitalism is the basis of every successful economy that exists today. Okay, and as we see there on the right, as Willy Wonka is telling us, you know, there is a lot of hatred against capitalism, and there are some problems with capitalism that we can talk about in class, but in the end, it still provides the basis for success. Now, what we also then have going along with that is mass production. Now, the idea we want to make lots of money. So the first guy that actually done this was Honoré Blanc, who used the idea of um, using standardized parts to create lots of guns in 1778 in France. This was then followed up by Eli Whitney with the cotton gin. And the idea with the cotton gin is that it was really the first mass-produced item that was made using standardized parts. So if I broke this part A over here on the cotton gin, I can go anywhere to get that part and replace it, which meant that these were easy to maintain and they were easy to make. Of course, the bad part of Eli, Fo Eli Whitney is then it expanded slavery, which is not good. He later expanded it to guns, so now we have more violence. And um, it starts to grow and grow and grow. 
Okay, and if you look on the notes, you see how it got it went. But in the early 1900s, the guy that changed it all was Henry Ford. Henry Ford had actually failed at business twice. He wanted to make cool cars, and he decided to further analyze production. If you look there on the right, that is actually a picture of a early 19-teens um, Ford plant. And what Ford realized is that if he could figure out a technology to move what he wanted to build to his workers that they could do it a lot faster. And in the end, for when he started this process, it took him three hours to make a car, okay? And that car would cost like two or three thousand dollars for someone to buy in 1915. And the fact of the matter is, is no one can do that. Well, by studying how men move and realizing that if you put everything on conveyor belts and make it automated, so an automated assembly line, that workers could then assemble stuff faster. And he broke everything down into smaller pieces. Like if you see here, like there's guys that'll put that tire on, there's guys that'll put that like center wheel on, there's guys that'll put this part on, and it goes on and on and on. So when Ford then took that three to four hour time to make a car, basically once the first car rolled off the uh, assembly line, every single day with Within every about 10 to 12 minutes, another car was produced. Thus, the cost of a car went from $2,000 to $490. What he then realized is by selling a lot more cars, he could increase the wages of our workers, and then they could actually buy the cars too. It's amazing what better than minimum wage can do. So in the end, this is how everything you guys have, the shirt you're wearing, the computer or the cell phone that you're listening on, that all comes from mass production. And of course, then in the end, you get these giant corporations, you get the joint stock companies, which we talked about, you know, these giant companies that are owned by multiple people, um, then people start to own different types of businesses, and that's where you get your conglomerates, as we all well know, and uh, Disney is the big example of that, but of course you have your negative ones like your Standard Oil and IG Farben, which are not good, which we'll talk a little bit about class. Standard Oil at one point owned 96% of all the oil in the United States, and even bigger than them was IG Farben, which actually controlled 90% of all of the chemicals in the world. And then you get these international corporations, which are even bigger, like the United Fruit Company and HSBC, which actually still exists today. That's the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. And so now you get these giant corporations, and then you've got, you need places to buy all this stuff. So the department store that you know is like Nordstrom or JCPenney's, um, Bon Marche, which up here is still open in France. That was your very first one, opened by Aristide and Marguerite Boussoucault. And then John Wanamaker opened the first one in the United States of America, which is no longer actually open. And that would be um, Wanamaker's in Philadelphia, and that's actually a picture of that uh, building over to the left. And now you have new marketing. It's all about sales and the salesman and how to draw people to your store, which now is how to draw people to your website. But in the end, all that cool stuff that you have, like, you know, this fun t-shirt, which really does show that you something is wrong to your phones, to all that wonderful and bad for you food, and eventually to DeLorean time machines, all of this brought to us by industrialization. All right, guys, I'll catch you tomorrow, and make sure you get your comments and questions.